your Bibles open to Colossians chapter 2 this morning, Colossians in the second chapter, as we again look at our theme verse for this particular year at First Baptist Church. My prayer is that this year God will grow this church, not just and not only numerically, that means people added, but that God will grow individual hearts and lives, those who are young, those who are elderly, those who are new, brand new Christians, and those who have been saved for decades, that everyone who is a part of First Baptist Church, whether by member or just coming, that they will grow in their walk with God this year, and that we can look back at the end of 2023, and we can see, boy, I grew in my faith, I grew in my knowledge of God's word, I grew in my obedience to God, that this year we will grow as a church. That makes sense what I'm saying, right? That, that we'll grow, and, and that people will be added to the church, of course, of course, but that God will do a great work this year. I've prayed in, for God's wisdom and came across this particular passage. Of course, it was a year and a half ago we preached the book of Colossians. Not an unfamiliar verse or concept. And sometimes when you come to a more familiar concept, um, we get a little bit disheartened because we like flashy. You know that God doesn't call us to be flashy, He calls us to be faithful. Moreover, it required in stewards that a man be found faithful. In Corinthians, the Bible says, but God is faithful. It's one of his attributes, characteristics, faithfulness of God, one that we should follow. In this concept, being rooted in Jesus Christ is one that I know from Scripture will absolutely revolutionize your life. It will change your life. It will change your relationships with your children, with your husband, wife, with your co-workers. When you're rooted in Jesus Christ, it will change your view on finances. It will change your perspective on politics. It will change everything you do when you are truly rooted in Jesus Christ. Colossians chapter 2, if you would please begin looking in verse number 6. For Paul says this through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, As ye have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him. The last two weeks we looked at that particular verse. What does it look like to walk in him? To abide in him. It looks like being close to him. It looks like leaning on him. Looks like obeying him. Verse 7, rooted and built up in him. And established in the faith as you have been taught, abounding therein. So whatever's happening here is something that, that should be abounding. It should be, it should be flourishing. It should not just be a, a fruit here or an apple here. It should be a bounty. It would be a bumper crop, a bumper yield. So what Paul's talking about challenging this church and challenging us, the Holy Spirit, is, is that what this concept, whatever it may be, we ought to abound in this teaching, in this, in this philosophy, in this thought. In verse number 8, beware, lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. For in him, that is Christ, that is Jesus Christ, dwell of all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and ye are complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power. Lord, as we come before you today, I ask that you would illuminate your scripture to us. Lord, I've tried to prepare and, and study as I saw I should, but Lord, I need your help this morning. I can't speak without your help. I pray that your spirit would illuminate the scripture in a way that would help us to understand what you want us to do and then to have the grace to follow you. Lord, I pray that today we could look back at the end of this day and say I grew in Jesus Christ because of your word and your Holy Spirit and our obedience. Lord, thank you for this time, for those who are here, and those who are online. Lord, we ask that you would do something supernatural and that all that you desire to accomplish would be accomplished today. In Jesus' name I ask. Amen. There is a fundamental desire inside of every single human to force God out of their life. This is the sin nature that we inherited after Adam and sinned in the garden. To replace God with ourself. 
We see it in current society in a few ways. We, we don't need God in medicine. We have science. Throughout history, they have done certain things, and it seems like eventually medicine will catch up to some of the Bible statements about medicine. You know, the Bible is not a doctor's manual, but the Bible does, does have some science in it. You know that? And anything the Bible says, anything the Bible says is true. I mentioned before, but you know that for a while they thought you were sick because of bad blood. And they would do bloodletting, put leeches on you. Yet the Bible says the life of the flesh is in the blood. All right? And they eventually they figured out that it was bad to empty you out of all your blood. But we try to force God out of medicine because we don't need God. We have science. We don't need God in our war because we have technology. In fact, I was reading in my Bible this morning. I'm reading, of course, in the book of Psalms as a church, and then I'm reading uh, separately. I read from the Bible uh, every three months or so. And where I was at this morning, there was a king, and this king was condemned because when they faced a trouble, he didn't go to God. He went to another country and said, hey, help us bail, help bail me out. And God sent a prophet and said, hey, what's wrong with you? Do you not trust me to be your help? And yet there is a fundamental desire in, huma in humanity that we want to force God out of every part of our life. We don't need God in our businesses because we have a savvy business mind. And yet when the stock market crashes, then the materials are bought at the wrong price and businesses fail. We don't need God in our school. We have our curriculum to guide us. God was not forced out when prayer was forced out of school. God has been trying to be forced out of education for as long as time has been. We don't need God in our government. We have the brilliance of our laws to help us out. Just let that sink in for a minute. We don't need God for our morality. We will, as a unit, determine what is right and wrong. We see throughout history that different civilizations decided that things were right that we compare to the Bible that were grossly wrong, morally wrong. But the whole unit said this was right, and so people went along with it. Even now in current time, we look back on history and say, boy, that was a bad decision. Because a unit as a whole cannot determine morality, God sets morality for us. Others say we don't need him for our children. We'll just provide a good environment and the experts will guide us. Ultimately, we say, God, we don't need you for our life. We can be self-made men and women. Even in the Bible, we find this thought process. Aaron, with the children of Israel, after Moses was gone on the mountain for a while... Too long in the children of Israel's estimation. They thought Moses was dead. And so Aaron collected their, their jewelry. And he fashioned this golden calf. Uh, uh, appears a cow. Perhaps a goat, but probably a cow. A golden cow and said, these be your gods. This be your God. This is what brought you out of the children, or out of Egypt. Now, my friends, the, the golden calf did no more for the children of Israel than it has for anyone since that time. In fact, I, I always kind of chuckle when I come to that story in my, in my Bible reading because Moses says, what are you doing, Aaron? And Aaron goes, I don't know what happened. I tossed in the gold and out popped this, this calf. Like anyone believes that. It sounds, this is why I chuckle, it sounds, no offense teenagers, like a teenage ex excuse. How did that happen? I don't know. I don't know. I just lit the fuse and the whole thing blew up. Oh, but, but you had no part in it. Oh, no, 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 no. Was it me? Was it me? Look at somebody else. Another king was sick. Instead of going to God, he inquired of Beelzebub. Elijah came to him and said, Is it not because there is not a God in Israel? You see, in, even in the Bible, we see that people have a desire, a fundamental desire, to force God out of their life. Throughout secular history... World history, God has been consistently trying to be forced out. From our so-called philosophers to those who even decided to explain how the universe came to be with Charles Darwin. But what is disconcerting, what is shameful, is when Christians who have been touched by Jesus Christ, those who have put their faith and hope 
and eternal destiny in Jesus when they begin to force God out of their life as well. Look at this passage just a few verses back. Verse number 3 of Colossians chapter 2, where the Bible says, where Paul says, And this I say. What is he saying? Look, look I'm sorry, verse number 3. In whom are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. In Jesus Christ, everything that we need, these treasures, wisdom and knowledge, how to live now and forever, is found in Jesus Christ. Peter says the same thing. We have everything we need for life and for godliness. It's found in knowing Jesus Christ. And Paul says, in whom, Jesus, are, are found all these things, the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. And verse number four, and this I say, lest any man should beguile you or persuade you or deceive you with persuasive words. What he's pointing out in this passage is that what happens and the life of these believers at Colossae, this church, is that there came along some people who brought some ideas, who brought some philosophies, who brought some concepts, and they were persuasive. I imagine the way they talked was very powerful. Maybe they used word pictures or they formulated their sentences or whatever it was, they were very convincing. And they spoke in such a way not to exalt Christ and to bring about his truth where there's treasure and knowledge and wisdom, but they came about to deceive, to beguile, to force Jesus Christ out. See, my friends, if we're not careful, we'll be deceived by the same philosophy. And unfortunately, it's not always an outward persuasion because we have the flesh inside of us, we have an inward flesh that desires to push God out as well. I don't know about you, my friend, but I can justify about anything. Can't you? Come on now, help me here. Can you justify things? I can be in a diet and I can justify another piece of cake. I can justify it. I can be saving money and I can justify buying something else. I'm talking about just normal things that necessarily aren't necessarily right and wrong, but, but we can justify about anything in our flesh. Ah, oh, this will be a good path. Now, I know it is, and for this reason, this reason, this reason, and, and then one of our friends or our spouse will bring a voice of reason in our life, and like, what are you thinking? Have you lost your ever-loving mind? Well, I just want to see it from this perspective. We can justify. Often, this forcing out is not external. Often, it is internal. That persuasive flesh that must be grounded, all right, our, our, we must be grounded in God. But we justify these things. We justify decisions. Say, well, you know what? Other places, they, they don't have church like first, but we don't have to go to church all the time. It's too much, it's too much. And we persuade ourselves about not worshiping maybe the way the Bible teaches us to worship. We look and having, the Bible says, itching ears. You see, this rooted in him is, like I said, it's not a flashy, not a flashy thing. There's flashy all over YouTube. If you want a flashy, a flashy title, a flashy sermon, you can find them all day long. And the Bible talks about that. It says in the last days that men, they'll have itching ears. They just want to hear this flash stuff. And there are pastors that will have millions of views on really what is just pop psychology. It's not foundational to the word of God. It'll get you through a hard little spot in your life, but it will not transform your life. It is not the truth from the Word of God. It is merely an opinion, all right, wrapped up in something nice. We're like, but that's what I like. Of course it is. Of course it is. You're saying that my flesh likes these things. And here Paul says, be careful because not only is there a fundamental desire, all right, but as Christians, we will, if we're not careful, push him out. We'll push him out. We don't need Jesus except for church on Sunday. We don't need Jesus in our home as the, as the home looks like a yelling and fighting and screaming match. We don't need him in our finances. I read a story about an old church in England. A sign in front of the building read this, We preach Christ crucified. Over time, Ivy grew up and obscured the last word. We preach Christ a little more time passed, and the ivy grew some more, and eventually the sign read, we preach. And eventually, ivy covered the entire sign. And the church 
died. Such is the case in our life when we're not rooted in Jesus Christ. I want to challenge us this morning about this passage, particularly verse number 7, rooted and built up in him. The next few weeks really begin to take this apart about what it means to be rooted in Jesus so that you and I will this year, this week, this month, and today be rooted and letting Jesus Christ root himself in our life. We can look back in Colossians and kind of see where this began. Colossians chapter 1, beginning verse number 2. If you look over just a page, where Paul says to the saints and faithful brethren in Christ, which are at Colossae, <coughs> grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We give thanks to God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you. Since we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love which ye have to all the saints, for the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, whereof ye heard before in the word of truth of the gospel, which is come unto you as it is in all the world, and bringeth forth fruit as it doth also in you since the day ye heard of it, and knew the grace of God in truth. The rooting of this concept begins at the moment of salvation. The moment that someone puts their faith and trust in Jesus Christ is the moment that this root, the Bible speaks of this root, that takes place in a believer's life. Before someone is saved, they are not at all rooted in Jesus Christ. They may know about Jesus Christ. They may be a faithful church attender. They may be a, a giver of their finances. They may serve. They may work in, in ministry. They may do a lot of good deeds, but they're not rooted in Jesus at all until they put their faith in Jesus Christ. Every single person has to decide at some point in their life whether to believe Jesus or to reject Jesus, to reject God. What I'll say to believe Jesus is three things. To believe, to believe in Jesus is to believe that he is who he says he is. He is the son of God, the only son of God. He does not have a real brother. He has some half-brothers who would be some siblings from Joseph and Mary, but he's not the brother of the devil. He's the only begotten Son of God. The Bible clearly teaches that. He is the Son of God. Jesus claimed to be God. He claimed to be God and man. To believe in Jesus is to believe not that he's just a good teacher, not that he just was a, someone who lived, but that he is the Son of God. To believe in Jesus is to believe that he did what he says he did. You know, Jesus said that he came to seek and to save that which was lost. That Jesus claimed that he would die on the cross and that he would rise again the third day, which he absolutely did. Jesus died and rose again the third day. He really did that. Right, this is foundation for our faith. Paul says that in Corinthians chapter 15. So to believe in Jesus is to believe that he is who he says he is, that he did what he said he would do, and that he will do what he said he will do which is that if you ask him for salvation, he will absolutely save you and forgive your sins. To believe on the Lord Jesus Christ that you can be saved that way. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. To the thief on the cross who came to Jesus for forgiveness while on the cross, Jesus said, today thou shalt be with me in paradise. He's never turned anyone away who's asked for salvation, to, who's believed in him. Now this is wonderful. This is wonderful. Because it's wonderful because... You can't just miss it if you truly want to believe in Jesus. There will be many who will miss it, but not because Jesus said, sorry, we're closed. Sorry, no vacancy. At the moment of salvation, we were established in Jesus Christ. Colossians 1, verse 11, a few verses down, says because of this rooting, this salvation, that we're strengthened with all might according to his power. Understand that in the growth cycle... In the growth cycle of plants, the fruit comes at the end. Right? You're like, wow, that was powerful. It's the way life works, right? So you get fruit after, after the thing has grown. So if I put a seed in the ground, I don't get fruit that day. But if I water and nourish it in the right environment, it will bring fruit, forth fruit, will it not? That's why, I mean, we had some farmers in this church and they plant crops, fully expecting to have something to harvest. They don't plant crops like, hey, I don't know what will happen. And they don't go out in the field and be like, hey, I, I 
planted seed yesterday. Where's my harvest? In the fruit-bearing cycle, fruit comes at the end. The cycle starts with the seed in the ground. And then when water and with the, and with the sun begins to put down roots. And the root system will continue to grow until eventually it breaks to the surface. And then you know that fruit will be on its way. Here's what you know this morning, that even though we have eternal security, even though we have faith in Jesus Christ, and if you've never trusted Jesus Christ, then today I want you to trust him. Put your faith in him. But even though we have eternal security, we are still vulnerable. Not for heaven. Jesus said that no man can pluck the, the Christian out of my Father's hand. Not for heaven. But in this life, we are open to attack. To, to thoughts that'll, that'll roll around in our head. That'll try to force God out of our life. Yes, we're established for the future, but right now. This is what Paul's talking about in chapter 2. You've been established in Jesus. You've been saved. But along the way, you're vulnerable. There's going to be influences. There's going to be thoughts. It's going to be persuasive. And it's going to try to distract you, discourage you, and to make that rooting very shallow. Look, Colossians chapter 2, verse 7. This word rooted, this morning, Brother Wilson brought a great message on stewarding Scripture how to interpret it correctly. He talked about, if you were there this morning, a particular Greek tense, which is a perfect tense, which means a past action brings continued and future results. He particularly mentioned the word uh, telestai, which is when Jesus on the cross said, it is finished. What he is teaching us from Scripture is this, that when Jesus said, it is finished, this past action, the one-time action on the cross, has results forever and forever and forever. Okay, you're asleep this morning. All right. You realize this is good. That when Jesus died on the cross, you know that, that many people have died. You realize that, right? Billions have perished. Right. But only one, but only one will have effect for eternity. Jesus Christ. All right. That is Jesus Christ, all right? And, and this word here, rooted, in Colossians chapter 2, verse 7, is the same uh, Greek tense as telestai, which means this, that this word rooted said, listen, this happened at a point in your life, or once it happened, way back here, the moment of salvation, you began to be rooted, but it's supposed to have continued effect in your life. It should have a continued touch on your life. That means that when I got saved, what happened then, for me at six years old, ought to affect the rest of my life. For some Christians doesn't affect much. Right? Some Christians don't seem to grow very much and bear much fruit. Other Christians flourish. Some Christians, it seems like, end up at the end of the day with all the struggle. I don't mean like the hardship in life, but where they're facing and battling the same thing over and over and they seem to, to be immature as a Christian, if we can say it that way. And over here you have a Christian who is young in the faith, but boy, you can see the maturity and depth. What's the difference? Being rooted in Jesus Christ. You see, this word has a concept that, that the source is not me, but him. It's a passive kind of a concept right here. We're rooted in Jesus Christ. Nothing can separate us from the love of God. But this idea, this verb uh, here, being rooted, has the idea and suggests stability. It suggests strength. It, it suggests a source from contact with Jesus Christ. You see, we're rooted. I want to, from Scripture, very briefly this morning, give you three significant concepts of being rooted in Jesus Christ. We're going to turn to three passages and see what it looks like to be rooted in Jesus Christ. The Bible will talk about being planted and what happens. I want you to turn to the first passage. Keep your finger in Colossians. We'll come back here. But turn to Psalm chapter 1 quickly this morning. Psalm chapter 1. If you've been around the Bible a little bit, you know this passage. in Psalm chapter 1. Because being rooted in Christ, number one, will bring profitability to your life. You want your life to be profitable? For Jesus Christ, then you need to be rooted in Jesus Christ. Psalm chapter 1 says this, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law 
doth he meditate day and night. This particular man is in the word of God, in God's way. He's looking for God's way to do things and to live life. He is rooted because he's saying, listen, day and night, I want God's instruction for my life. Not my own instruction, not my own persuasive thoughts, but I want God's instruction. Lord, how do I navigate this scenario? Lord, show me. How do I navigate this irritation at work? Lord, how do I navigate this particular bill or this health crisis? In his law, doth he meditate day and night. He wants God's instruction. He's rooted. And what happens? Verse number three. And this man shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper or be profitable. It does not mean that, boy, that my bank account will fill up. Boy, I'll have success. That means I'll invest in the stock market, and, and oh, boy, I'll just make millions. No, no, no. It means that as you live your life, the decisions that you make, the circumstances that you have to go through, How you live that, you will be profitable. You will prosper. Your life will not be meaningless, but it will have have a greater reason. When a life is not only established in Jesus, but strongly rooted in Jesus, in his word, how I live, the decisions I make, the job I work at, whether secular or sacred, will be profitable. Picture this, two guys work at the same shop, working the same machine, Both are Christians. One sees every day through the light of God's word. He sees interactions with co-workers as divine appointments from God. He sees opportunities to share scripture and to emulate characteristics of godliness. The other man is a Christian, shows up on Sunday, but beyond that, he does very little with God or his word. One One, the one who is rooted in Christ, will see see his life being profitable for Jesus. He will know that even though he's at this machine, that God placed him there for a reason. The other one will be frustrated. He'll say, all day long, all I do is just work at this machine, and nothing happens. The difference is not the machine or the job or the money. The difference is that one is rooted in Jesus Christ, and the other is not. One will see the profitability from God, the other will not. Picture two ladies, both at home. One frustrated, irritated. I'm in my husband's limelight, nothing matters. The other one is rooted in Jesus Christ, dwelling in the Word of God, seeing his perspective. One will see the greater value, the other will be frustrated. My friends, don't miss this. If you are frustrated, then you're not being rooted right now. If you're frustrated, you're not being rooted. If you're frustrated, you're saying, I don't see it. I can't make sense of it. I'm not happy with it. Someone who's rooted says, I'm delighting in God's instruction his way. And I know that what he will do is make these actions profitable. I can't figure it out. I may not understand it. But if you're frustrated, you're not rooted. Number two, being rooted in Christ will bring confidence to your life. Turn over from Psalms to Jeremiah chapter 17. Jeremiah chapter 17. This one's good. This one's good. Don't miss this. If you write in your Bible, I'd highlight these verses. Jeremiah chapter 17, verse number 5. Thus saith the Lord, Cursed be the man that trusteth in man, and maketh flesh his arm, and whose heart departeth from the Lord. He said, be careful when you trust yourself. Be careful when you trust your own arm of flesh, your own strength, when you trust your own ability to solve a problem. I can get rid of this bill. I'll work overtime. Be careful to trust the arm of flesh. That's what the the Bible's talking about. I just got to think harder and, and apply myself more. Be careful. He shall be. Verse 6, like the heath in the desert shall not see when good cometh, but shall inhabit the parched places in the wilderness in a salt land and not inhabited. His life will be dry. His life will be vacant. His life will be unfulfilling. Verse 7, blessed is the man that trusteth in the Lord and whose hope 
the Lord is. For he shall be as a tree planted by the waters, and that spreadeth out her roots by the river, and shall not see when he cometh, but her leaf shall be green, and shall not be careful in the year of drought, neither shall cease from yielding fruit. Look there at that little phrase, and shall not be careful in the year of drought. It's a little, we don't say it quite that way any longer. But what that verse is saying, he says, when someone trusts in God, they will not be anxious when a hard time comes. They will not be worried when things look like drought. Or when someone puts their trust in God, fear and anxiety are set aside. You see, if you're frustrated, you're not being rooted. And if you're full of fear and worry and anxiety, you're not being rooted. But then look at this. One of the most familiar verses in all of Scripture is the next verse. It says this, For the heart is deceitful above all things. You see it? You've heard that verse before, haven't you? That's where it comes. That, that's the context. Like we learned this morning, right? He said, listen, don't trust yourself. Trust in God and be careful because your heart, your heart will push you aside and give you cause to worry. So when you're worried, when you're anxious, when you're fearful, you can mark it down. You are not rooted. Because someone who's rooted will be like a tree planted by the rivers of water who will bear the fruit. You see, being rooted in Christ not only brings profitability, it brings confidence in your life. This really solves, in a sense, life's problems. It doesn't bring a solution, but it brings a solution. It says, you know what, God? You're in control. I know. I know who you are. So I don't have to know this. Let me give you one more this morning. Being rooted in Christ will not only bring profitability, number two, not only bring confidence, but number three, It'll bring the main purpose for your life. Why are we here? Two quick passages to look at. I want you to connect these dots. Luke chapter 4 and Isaiah 61. Luke chapter 4 and Isaiah 61. Luke chapter 4, Jesus Christ was tempted in the wilderness. When he was done being tempted and, and had complete victory in the temptation of the devil, all right, he returned into Galilee. So the Bible says in Luke chapter 4, verse 13, when the devil ended all the temptation, he departed from him for a season. Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit into Galilee. Verse number 15, he taught in their synagogue, being glorified of all. In verse 16, and he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up, and his custom was he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up there for to read. Verse 17. And there was delivered unto him the book of the prophet Isaiah. We're going to get to Isaiah, so keep your finger on Isaiah. When he opened the book, he found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is written upon me because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovering of sight to the blind, and set at, set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. In verse 21, he began to say unto them, This day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears. Now turn to Isaiah 61. You're going to see the connection here, this last point. Isaiah chapter 61, the first couple of verses, it says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Exactly what Jesus Christ quoted in Luke chapter 4, or read. He hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. He has sent me to, to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to them that are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all that mourn, to appoint unto them that mourn in Zion, to give unto them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the Spirit of heavens, that they might be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord. My last little phrase. That he might be glorified. You see, when I'm rooted in Jesus Christ, it is not just for my benefit, though I am immensely benefit from it. It is not just like a self-help, hey, you have some fear, plant yourself in Jesus Christ, though it will solve that problem. All right, rooted in Jesus Christ will, will, will help solve the, the, the fear problem in life. Being rooted in Christ brings the main purpose of life, which is 
to glorify God. And if I'm not seeking actively to glorify God, then I'm not rooted. If I'm seeking my own path, I'm not rooted. If I just care about my kids and my little, my little world, I'm not rooted. There was a man who was a pastor for many years. He said this, he said for 15 years I lived in a, a place, a parsonage that had a pear tree in the garden. He said, but never a respectable pear did it yield me all the time. He said, I am no gardener, but my successor was. And strange to relate, after I left, he had a bumper crop his very first year. He goes on to say this, why? He went at the roots, which I was too ignorant to do. My friends, God wants you to have a bumper crop of fruit in your life. When Jesus Christ saved you, all right, that root began, it was established, but it was there to, and the point was to have continuing effect and result in a life, in a heart, in a family, in a church, in a city. This rooting will do all of that, but we must take care of the root to be sure that we don't force God out you see, if you find yourself relegating God to just a portion of your day, then you're forcing God out of your root system. If you find that your decisions and your priorities are apart from God, then you are not being rooted in God. You're being rooted in yourself. Your life will reflect that. You see, in the growth cycle of fruit-bearing plants, fruit comes at the end. Both the plant and the root system will keep growing until the plant is strong enough and mature enough to bear fruit. They say that when you go to the redwoods, to the avenue of the giants, you see these trees towering above you, hundreds of feet above you. They tell me that the root system is as tall, as wide as the trees are and even, and even larger than that. My friends, in your life and my life, I hope you're saved. If you're not saved, today the Bible says today is a day of salvation and believe in Jesus. But if you're saved, are you focused on being rooted in Jesus Christ? Are you actively saying, God, I want to seek your will, your path. I want my life to be profitable in your economy, being rooted in Jesus Christ. Not forcing him out and just relegating him to a Sunday decision or Wednesday night, but seeking his face? Are you looking for him to touch and to change you? Are you looking to put him in the priority, as Colossians 1 tells us, in every aspect of life? So that we can say, with words, Paul, whether therefore you eat or drink or whatsoever you do, that we do all to the glory of God. You see, if you want to have a prosperous and a rooted life, you must take care of the roots. Lord.